wild life. I was refreshing look at the nice ad for a thing being sold on Twitch. And then I can see if we are live. Thanks for joining, uh, for enjoying this awkward moment with us. If I'm already on screen. Uh -oh. Oh, oh, yeah. That looks like nice video game. 11, 10, 9, 8, uh. 6, 5, 4, 3, uh, three. Two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome to the Rollist Present. I am Kalum, your host. Uh, it's all, hopefully, it will become a monthly rendezvous to discuss tabletop role playing games here in Europe across the pond with all of you, all fine uh, listeners, viewers of the RPG Academy Network. We are meeting today to discuss recipes and what is a better country to discuss good recipes than Great Britain. But more specifically, we'll be discussing about Kickstarter's recipes. And I've got three amazing guests to discuss that today. Mary, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Mary Hamilton. Um, I'm one of the three founders of Rowan, Rook and Deckard. Um, we uh, make Spire. Uh, we kickstarted this year um, a new system called Heart. Um, and we made, made Goblin Quest and various other bits and pieces, including a lot of um, one page RPGs that are written primarily by Grant Howitt, who's one of the other founders. Um, and my job uh, is everything that isn't writing RPGs. Uh, so that covers finances, it covers running the Kickstarters, it covers uh, lots of extremely boring and in some cases really interesting bits and pieces some critical bits uh, i would say these are the kind of things which allow you to fund your project and i believe we've got a project just about to be funded tonight isn't that the case josh and i hope so i'm sitting on tenterhooks or have been until until this moment i promise i'm not uh, refreshing it right now shall i introduce myself <laughs> So I'm Josh Fox. I'm one half of Black Armada Games. We are the publishers of Lovecraft Esque, Flotsam, Adrift Among the Stars, and Bite Marks. And as Callum has just said, we've currently got our latest game, Last Fleet, on Kickstarter. Uh, it's about uh, £200 or $250 away from being funded. Uh, I'm fine, everything's fine. <laughs> totally relax. Um, I probably should say a little bit about Last Fleet while I just take the opportunity. Um, it's a role-playing game inspired by Battlestar Galactica about the last fleet of humanity fleeing from an inhuman enemy that's pursuing them across space after destroying their civilization. And it's a Powered by the Apocalypse role-playing game. So if you like that, uh, when you've finished watching this, you can go and back it. <laughs> oh, don't wait, don't wait. Go there and go fund it so we can have a good news right in the middle of this show. Uh, Gary, you managed to help fund uh, quite a few projects. What's, can you introduce yourself and tell us what's your experience with Kickstarter? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Gary Harper. Uh, I'm a tabletop consultant. Um, I've worked on uh, many of the Modifius uh, Kickstarters, uh, particularly my pride, which is uh, Conan, Robbie Howard, uh, Kung Fu Panda, Corvus Belly Affinity, uh some red scars which was um kings of war as well um and i've done some with uh free league and symborium as well um so i've been quite involved with kickstarters for uh, quite a number of years now um, some very successful ones sorry i was making sure people were aware that we are live so uh let's get started so kind of the running uh, question and gag of the, the release present is to start, try to work out how things might be or might not be different across borders. Uh, so British Kickstarter campaigns, I was wondering, is there, is there, are there British Kickstarter campaigns you found especially interesting uh, in the past, well managed, especially successful? Um, Mary? Um, it's interesting because I think 
in my experience, the main difference between British Kickstarters um, and US led Kickstarters tends to be the way that shipping and distribution is handled. So when I'm looking at projects, specifically British projects, oftentimes I'm looking at interesting ways that people have kind of tackled that. Um, and the, I guess I wanted to call out the Melsonian Arts Council um, and some of the work that they've been doing to try to get, uh, to try and work on distribution, I think has been really interesting. Um, so they published uh, Troika, a new minutes edition Kickstarter. Um, Troika is available um, for, I believe, as uh, I believe the previous edition is available for free, but they kickstarted a um, project to fund a uh, really a high quality, uh, beautiful print run of, of, of a new version, a new edition of that. Um, and they've been doing some, they've been doing some interesting work with other people as well, including uh, Soul Muppet Publishing, who I think are publishing both in the UK with Marsonian and also uh, had structured their rewards for their most recent Kickstarter around whether or not you're based in the US. So for US publishers, they, it looks to me as though they have a completely separate production stream from the one that they're doing for the UK. Um, I think there's some really interesting um, in really creative ways that people are trying to solve the problems around uh, being in Britain rather than being in the US. There's no language barrier, which is fantastic, um, but there's a real expectation from US backers that shipping will be cheap. Yes. Um, and that can be extremely challenging if you're running everything and distributing actually out of the UK. I think some people forget that we're on a small little island sometimes. And we're, I think they think we're a lot, lot bigger. Um, and I don't know why you're saying that right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of this is obviously pending what happens uh, at the end of the month and uh, indeed the end of the year regarding Brexit. I imagine distribution will get much more complex uh, before it gets much more straightforward. So, Gary, distribution, I believe that's one of your specialty. Uh, so do you have yes. anything to add on that? Well... <laughs> When it comes to, uh, I think you're asking about the Brexit sort of scenario on that one. Um, and I think it depends how it hits the country economically wise. Uh, for distribution wise, if you're shipping books out, you generally you should be okay on books because you shouldn't be paying taxes on books. So um, there's a lot of companies now that I'm advising that you print in straight into your countries if you've got enough quantities. So at Modifius, we were, we, we were lucky enough to have huge quantities. So we were using uh, printers in America, actually mainly in Canada, which is what we did, particularly for the White Wolf Vampire games. Um, and the other way you could do it is, is uh, using bonding warehouses as well, which is getting very technical now. But there, there, are, there are many options uh, for people to do. Um, but it, it really depends if we've got a hard brexit or a soft brexit as well so that's the big question mark at the moment um and the problem is, is no one really knows what deals can be put in place at the moment um so what i'm telling people at the moment is, is at the moment is do your payments last so if you're doing a kickstarter and you're collecting all the money collect all the money later because the rates of shippings just keep going up and up and up and up which means we can't get cheaper rates over to the us and obviously that affects distributions and distrib main distributors in America is, are getting a bit worried about the Brexit as well. Going back to something slightly less dystopian, uh, Josh, your own uh, dystopian game in space, <laughs> uh, is there anything when you started introducing it to potential backers uh, about yourself and your team being in Europe, in Great Britain, that you you stress, you build upon in your communication, or or is it something people are aware of, or you just you know uh, don't really mention it, and it doesn't really matter to backers? Are there any views on that? So I, I certainly don't uh, emphasize it or de-emphasize it in particular, and in fact, I've had one or two people, I think European people, think that I was that we were an American company, um, possibly because we're so well plugged into kind of uh, us uh social networks, which is obviously a really key thing um, to have sorted out. 
Um, we do, I mean, sorry to go straight back to the dystopian um, future of, of this country, but uh, we do talk about Brexit. Um, I think one of the things that you need to do in launching a Kickstarter is to show that you have understood all of the practical issues that you might come up against so that people will trust you, particularly if you're new and you haven't gotten a sort of pre-existing reputation to lean on. And so it's obviously very important to say, yeah, it's going to happen. We've thought about it. Um, th this is what we think would uh, happen and how we would handle it. So um, in a way, right now, and for our last two Kickstarters, which have both um, been equally sat in the Brexit uncertainty zone, um, we have been emphasising our Britishness more than usual. As a way to be straightforward or in the nature of the product? Or... <clears throat> you mean in terms of... But why did you stress that more? Because of the news and you had to stress the, the reality that the logistics might be a challenge uh, at the end of the, the campaign? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, don't make a very big deal about it, but it, it is, I, so just sort of following on from what uh, Mary and Gary said, the big worry that I have is actually not about prices, although that can be a problem. And, and our, um, our first, I think it was our first Kickstarter, took place um, before the Brexit referendum had really uh, kind of had its effects on currency values. Uh, and so the change in exchange rates was quite a big deal for us. It actually sucked quite a lot of money out of the Kickstarter because we were paying people in the US dollars um, money that we have er had earned before the pound had crashed, but paying them after the pound had crashed. So that was quite fun. Um, but no, the, the thing that we're emphasizing at the moment is more about kind of there might be delays. There might be delays at the port. Um, you know, if if it uh, we're aiming to deliver uh, last fleet at the end of the year, if we deliver to the end of the year, all is well. If it's January next year, uh, you might find the books are sat at the port for longer than expected. Um, people will still get their stuff, hopefully. But well, sorry, it's of course it's where you print from as well. It makes a big difference. So there's a lot of people print in China, so that that makes a huge impact. And if you're printing in Europe, okay, we're part of Europe what the governments are now doing across Europe, which you guys are probably aware of, but other people might not be, is uh, Germany and France are now basically said, we want English people, companies to have Erie codes, which you shouldn't actually need one because we're still part of the EU. We haven't left it yet, but they're insisting that we have them. So they're already put in preparations that they've already basically said we've left, as far as they're concerned, we've left. So that creates a lot more delays and there's a lot of companies out there who have not got the correct paperwork, which is what you said, you know, it creates delays for you when you're shipping across now. Yeah, and we, in fact, we got that with um, bite marks that we thought, oh, it's all done, you know, it's gonna be sent off and our, our, our warehousing partner, a very experienced uh, company called Kixto, seemed to have it all under control. And then to their surprise, we were asked for an error code. Um, it didn't take long to sort out, but it's it's all kind of added uh, friction. Well, I had one scenario of one company, I won't say a name, but one company who, who didn't have one set up and it, it, it went to their ports and it got stuck in customs. They applied for it all. There was a query on it. It took a, a it got stuck in customs for a week and customs then gave them the fee, charging fee for holding it for a week, which was quite a few thousand pounds. And it was a huge blow. And so you, you can't question the government. <laughs> That's it, you know, you, you need to do it. So yeah, it, it can be, if you're not prepared, I mean, it sounds like you're very prepared, but if you're not prepared, it can be a real damage blow for a company. So preparation, yes. We, oh yeah, sorry, Mary, go ahead. I just, just gonna say, I think there's a really interesting tipping point, which probably all of us have experienced between the point where you're producing a few hundred books where print on demand um, and digital print can can be quite a straightforward way to get books out to people there's a kind of tipping point where you want to be moving over to doing offset or uh, lithographic print runs where you're printing books in bulk and you then have a completely different issue around how you get those books into the hands of customers 
Um, so we've actually done quite a lot of work ahead of the Heart Kickstarter, well, or, and to some extent as a result of how successful the Heart Kickstarter was for us. And we had uh, nearly two and a half thousand backers for that. Um, and we did a lot of work thinking about how we would go about distributing to the US in bulk. And that's thinking that we're doing as a small company that we're doing for the first time. So there's a there's a real distinction between the kind of distribution setup that you want if you're a small creator who's maybe on their first project who isn't necessarily thinking about turning this into a, a full time gig versus where you might end up if you've got multiple like 1000 plus backers across multiple different countries and you're thinking about printing in bulk in a single location and then and then shipping being a separate part of that i think um drive through rpgs print on demand um process is pretty solid and pretty straightforward for a lot of people it's not even though it's not something that we would choose to use it's there and it works and if what you're after is to get your book into people's hands it's a relatively low cost relatively low risk way of doing that and the complex thing about that is that as a if you're british you might end up in a world where it's actually easier to distribute directly to americans because of the way the drive through is set up than it is to distribute to people in your own country um there's i think it's, e it's easy to forget that not everyone wants the same not every creator or not every company wants the same things um out of the projects that they're creating. So there's, I think there's these inflection points that happen in the growth of a creator or the growth of a company. I think there's a big one around 500 books printed and probably another big one around 2000. Um, and I imagine Gary, that you probably say there's others that are at higher levels that I have no awareness of yet. Yeah, yeah, they, they drastically change, yeah. <laughs> I assume the big difference is also whether or not, and if it's possible to have books shipped to local game stores as well as being delivered person to person directly yeah distribution's a whole separate exciting thing and distribution seems to be very different in the us to anywhere else that i've experienced um again i think gary would probably be best place to talk more about that i just saw a look of extreme pain on his face <laughs> Yeah, distribution um, in the US is is a lot lot different to the to the UK. Absolutely. Um, Moving away from from distribution, sorry, I'm trying to move us back slightly in the structure. Uh, I was wondering, are there any Kickstarter campaign by other people uh, or of each others? Uh, which you thought were especially interesting, well managed, or successful. What what are the, what is today the most successful Kickstarter campaign in Great Britain? Is it hard? I'm not sure what the most successful yeah. one. I think that they're, they're all measured differently. If you're saying by the most amount of money uh, of RPGs and. Yeah. <laughs> I think Modifius has got one of the highest for um, theirs, but it it depends what you're trying to use Kickstart for. Um, I always tell people Kickstarter, successful Kickstarter is is if it's reached a lot of people, it's a marketing platform, and the money is the secondary part that comes through from it. It's it's what's your goals. Um, so I, I'm not really a big believer on what's successful because every company is different and they're all molded differently to what their what their objectives are. Obviously, the main objective is to get funded, but there's usually many other objectives to them as well. I think you can see some really nice examples of that if you look at the way that Evil Hats Kickstarters tend to be structured, for example. Um, the, they don't do shipping outside the US at all. And the majority of their Kickstarters are structured primarily to get books into distribution. So they're funding big print runs and they are trusting that they have a system set up post Kickstarter that will get the books into the hands of everyone that wants them. So they can afford to be really relaxed, or at least in my, in my, to my understanding, at least they can be afford to be much more relaxed about that kind of high number total, because that isn't actually where that company is going to see the real returns. It's a marketing tool that gets the word out. It builds a community around the product. If you're smart with the way that you're using your updates, it builds a channel by which you can tell people and kind of build a bit of buzz around the release. Um, but for them, their direct to customer sales, I would imagine are dwarfed by what they're looking for in distribution sales and the Kickstarter is a means to get to distribution. 
Whereas for us, we do a lot more sales direct to consumers because we, we just aren't in that distribution sort of network yet. Um, I imagine, Josh, you're probably, you're probably in a similar position to we are, but I think even you've talked, even you said you have a higher proportion of uh, distribution sales than we do at the moment. So it's, it's a completely different, um, yeah, it's a different use case. And I think Kickstarter is the start of something. It's not the end of something. It isn't like you've done the Kickstarter and then you go home and that's, that isn't that ace and excellent. Um, it's, it's a pre-order phase for something you've then got to produce, create, um, and get into people's hands. And that isn't necessarily the end either. Um, I think Spire, we funded, we sold about a thousand copies during the Kickstarter campaign. We sold the same number again in the 12 months following the Kickstarter campaign. Um, and then had to fund a reprint because we, you know, we, we, we thought we were quite ambitious, suggesting that we print double the number of books that we sold at Kickstarter. But actually, it sold much better than that. And we then had to fund a reprint. So there's a lot of complexity in the way that you might think that you think about building this as a longer term thing, as opposed to a short single burst. I assume this kind of le levels, depending of the, the type of creator you are, I guess the, the basic level would be sort of you want to make a product and have it handed to the, the the people funding the Kickstarter and you want to break even and that's a sort of the smallest ambition, although it's, it's only a, a big ambition in, in my view. Uh, the second one is sort of, yeah, having a, a wider reach and it's an exercise in a promotional exercise. Then you got people like, like yourself and like, uh, Federico with Nebiru who has been using the Kickstarter to pay for copies to be shipped to actual shops and uh, and so on. I mean, I would say um, you don't necessarily know which of those you are until after the Kickstarter has happened. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, if you when we did Lovecraft Desk, our first Kickstarter, we sold something like 400 physical copies and we thought that was meant that we should do print on demand because it, that was the level at, at which we were kind of operating like it would be crazy to print um hundreds of extra books um because it would lose us money um and then two years later it was obvious actually we should have done a print run and we would have been significantly better off if we had done. We didn't know that at the time. Um, we, we, I mean, like like Maz, we, we sold the uh, same amount again within, uh, I don't know, a year or 18 months or something. And, and we're, now, we're now up to three times as many. So if we'd had those printed, um, that would have been all to the good. But you, d you don't know that. Um, so it's sort of a bit of a, you, you're sometimes sort of flying blind, really. Um, both at the beginning, the middle, the end, you know, throughout, you're never quite sure where you are relative to where you want to be. So we'll what are the lessons you have learned with those past campaigns, which you applied up front with Last Fleet, for instance? Um, I mean, the big one was indeed uh, to, to go for a print run if at all possible, um, because the tail unless you know you can always just down tools and say brilliant we create a pod book stick it on drive through drive through or handle our future sales that's all good you know that's great that's like that is taking away a level of stress you're never going to have to worry about your warehouse copies getting eaten by rats or something but um there will be a tail of sales afterwards if you prepare for it and so all of our subsequent kickstarters we've uh, we've printed a load of extra books uh, it remains to be seen whether that will turn out to have been a good decision because you, again you don't know like whether the, uh, similar things are going to turn out to be similar later on but that's the, the choice we've made and I think it's already worked out financially as a good thing to do for like for example Flotsam so that was a, a wise choice um, I mean the other uh, the other learning point that we had uh, was probably around uh, 
we, I mean, we, we, we put in some contingency for our first campaign, but we, we, we kind of, the first campaign taught us that you really, really do need that contingency. So it was kind of telling us that we'd done something right the first time and not to change it. Uh, we always include 10% contingency fund because shit happens. <laughs> Yeah, I should say we that 10% contingency fund has saved our bacon a couple of times. Um, but also in, in the run up to Brexit for Heart, we budgeted a an additional um, an additional contingency per backer for all of our physical backers. Um, just to be absolutely sure that if something, you know, but at the time when we were um, when we were our budgeting was done on the basis that if that happened we would still want to get our books to people and the impact of that on currency and on everything else might be um tricky uh for us to manage what about you gary as a, as a consultant in the field uh, I'm what sorry i missed right? the conversation my i don't know if my internet was breaking no up. i think it, it happened here so we we lost a, a, a bit of it um, the question was, what, what sort of advice should you consider up front when you are considering doing a Kickstarter campaign? What sort of advice, sorry? Yeah, what sort of thing should you start with, uh, with a Kickstarter campaign? Uh, can you be a bit more specific? Okay. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to take... <laughs> uh, there was, there, there was a, it really crashed out on me. <laughs> yeah, no, it was sort of, of in the flow, but uh, it's a good opportunity to raise a question, which was asked by Jane Hermiston from... Uh, the tabletop, London Tabletop Industry Network. Uh, she was asking, is it, so it's more but specific, at what stage do you start thinking about income and expenses? Straight from the beginning, uh, whenever you're planning a Kickstarter, um, I always tell people to do spreadsheets uh, and plan everything out um, by different volumes different stages uh, of how well you're getting me funded and how many uh, products have you got one core book that you're putting out. I get quotes at different staggering levels. So you can forecast plan it uh, on how much are you going to be raising. So if you hit 1000 copies or backers um, with X amount of money, you can then look at, right, this is how much I'm saving. And then you stagger it across on your forecast on your spreadsheet. Um, so that's the sort of service you provide to your client? No, I don't do financial sites at all. Finance is not my strong point. <laughs> that's the one thing I won't do. <laughs> so I give them a very, very basic idea on things that you should be doing on your financial sides of things that I won't go into. But I can recommend accountants for that. <laughs> Josh, uh, have you... When... I mean, you're, it's not your first Kickstarter, so... I guess from the, the very moment you you had the idea settled for last week, you were considering those questions. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I mean, we've I, I like to think we've got it down to a fine art now. Although of course we haven't hit certain of those inflection points that um, were being mentioned earlier, where maybe things won't quite work out the way that we think. But you know, you have your we we, we have a spreadsheet that we use basically every time now. Um, you know, it lists off the different reward tiers. We know roughly what percentage of people are going to go for a given reward tier. Because, um, I mean, and you don't need to have done lots of Kickstarters to do this, by the way. Um, when we did this for Lovecraft Desk, we went and just looked at a representative sample of about a dozen uh, campaigns. You can see people do different price structures and you can see the impact that it has on uh, what rewards people are going to take so you can you can kind of work that stuff out you've got to include your fees you've got to include your contingency uh you, you, you calculate your your print prices and you can go and get your quotes and all the rest of it i mean i i just yeah the, the earlier you can plan it the better um because you don't want to be doing it last minute um and it, having that planned then enables you to think about interesting stuff like, oh, could I do a special edition book that I can do as a higher reward tier? Am I going to be able to afford stretch goals? What that might, what might that look like? And what, how much money will I be able to afford to offer to my stretch goal writers to do the work? Um, all of that stuff. It takes a little while to work it through. So yeah, I, I agree with what Gary said about 
you know the sooner the better basically as soon as you you feel like you're on the way to having a product that you might sell business plan yeah. basically is really yeah. Good yeah. yeah i think there's um there's a really common thing with new creators who are doing this as a side gig where people don't want to pay themselves um and i'm here to say you should pay yourself you should work out how much it you need to be paid and then you should incorporate that into your kickstarter funding goal because you deserve to be paid um and uh yeah if, if you're if you're a small creator thinking about your first time kickstarter that is super super important because there's a sense that if it funds really well then that's when you get the money actually that's generally not the case because by the time you've added stretch goals and dealt with the consequences of being massively successful oftentimes that that eats into your your quote unquote profits and that's what becomes your income um we made this mistake with goblin quest which is the very first kickstarter that i helped to run actually i think two three years before we became before we actually incorporated properly as a business we were running it through a different setup um that key point people are very keen and very willing to spend money on everything else but not necessarily to compensate their own time um, that can be a really really complicated and difficult kind of psychological hurdle to get past so if you ever need anyone to just tell you that you deserve to be paid as a tabletop creator i'm at news mary on twitter i will gladly provide that as a service uh, if you need it well it almost feel you know from experience as someone on the other end as a recipient of uh, you know, a, a backer uh, i I'm almost tempted to say that it's, you know, even if you were the, the most negative about the money you you deserve, which uh, again, uh, I think you're entirely right, Mary, whoever is having a creative endeavor should be rewarded for this endeavor. But worst case scenario, see that as a liability itself, because I supported a couple of Kickstarters, which ended up in rather long delays. So I don't know if the creators did consider paying themselves enough or not, but they did encounter personal financial difficulties. And I mean, as a backer, uh, I mean, I, I would never argue with the creators of those projects when they'd have been in a situation where it was their very survival, <laughs> which required them to to take money from money of the whole project, which could have been going to something else, paying prints to be shipped and so on. So uh, as a backer, please uh, anticipate you being rewarded by your game because if you're taking a risk of spending time, and it's gonna take a lot of time from what I've heard from a lot of people engaging in that, uh, well, it's fair that you get, it's not only fair that you get money to, to pay for the work you put in, but it's very important for the very survival of the project that you, you get an income from that project so that it pays for your survival. <laughs> because if you don't survive, well, as a backer, if even if I'm very, very cruel, if you don't survive, I don't get my project in the end. So nobody's going to be happy about that. It's a very grim way to look at things. But yeah, if you... If you don't have the tiny, tiny, tiny uh, deserved bit of ego that says I should be paid for this, that's my answer to you. Yeah, yeah, you need to be paid for this. I actually have a bit. Uh, I'm going to oppose this one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I that's truly, a debate. I truly believe everyone needs to be paid, and I believe there's a lot of writers as well in this industry that don't get paid enough. But as uh, and I'm a huge one of pushing them, and that they should get a proper rates but when you're running your own business which is effectively what you're doing when you're doing a kickstarter i have found a lot of businesses who have put that onto their target goal and they said i, I need eight grand for example for to fund my core book and then they have put on another eight grand on top of it for their own fee and they're like are you have how much time have you spent putting this book together you need to make sure the money you're putting on top is a reasonable amount because now you're asking for a lot more to get funded 
there are ways that you can get funded um, and get paid at the same time. For example, putting them in stretch goals, maybe you reduce some of the margins down so you can get some money to, as well as your Kickstarter goes, you can get a little bit of money in there. Don't lock it into your funding goal, which is the mistake I see a lot of people do, and a lot of them don't get funded, so they get no money. I see, I'd say the flip side of that is that if you can't afford to run your business for the time that it would take to produce the book, or produce the game then you don't have a kickstarter you have a failed business yeah absolutely so if it comes down to you need this amount of money to keep the business running and you don't fund at that amount then unfortunately that's the economics of it your your project isn't hasn't been successful because you literally couldn't fund it at at what it would cost to make like staff costs writing costs running costs for business are part of that equation and the goal right has to be to get ahead of that cycle it's got to be to get to a place where the the ongoing payments that you're receiving from your back catalogue are what is paying your day-to-day -day wages and paying your production costs and getting you ready for that Kickstarter. Um, but a lot of people, when they're first starting out, they're not in that cycle. No. And if you're trying to do this genuinely to create a sustainable business, sometimes the only option is to load all of your costs into that first Kickstarter or a meaningful chunk of costs into that first Kickstarter if you're not lucky enough to be able to subsidize it in some other way hmm. it's, and it's like just, and like it just out. don't don't go bankrupt for the sake of your book no no absolutely not i like i said i just seen too many times when it's been a mistake when people put far too much into it but then if you're if you've if you've made a solid kickstarter and you've done a lot of marketing on your kick pre-marketing and i'm not talking about one month or two months I'm talking about six months to eight months worth of pre-marketing on your kickstarter you've got a good chance of getting funding uh so put realistic figures down don't put insane figures down which i've seen too many times and there has been a number of people who have done long pre-kickstarters and they've stretched their uh, personal pay, payments or whatever wages into it, but they've put it staggered across the Kickstarter into the stretch goals where they're like, well, if we get this target, I'll take a few quid into that. And I'll take a few quid into the next one. Not all into the chunk at the beginning because otherwise you're funding too much onto them and not onto the project itself. But I do agree with you. That makes sense. Really paid. And so you, you're sort of having the, the argument the same argument, but on, on both sides of yeah. the corner, I guess it, it's a business plan. So yeah. as, exactly as Mary says, uh, if, if, if the plan for your business is not uh, deliverable, uh, you don't have a business yet. Uh, there might be reasons for that. There might be, and on the opposite, if you don't anticipate of having to pay yourself, but also other people, artists and so on, everyone, uh, every expense and yeah just pay what is needed to where it's needed not more not less and uh, yeah that's your plan that's why you need an accountant and people with experience probably or, or have a modest start maybe the project is too too ambitious at the start i guess i assume josh any opinion on that yeah so i, I mean i'm very much in the pay yourself camp but um I, I, there's a couple of things that i wanted to kind of add to what others have already said one is you've done the work to make the game already probably um, or at least I advise you to have done that I don't advise you to take a product to Kickstarter that you have not already written because uh, you're just opening yourself up to potentially months and years of work on something that you might lose your mojo on I just don't advise you to do that um, but you are also going to be doing a load of work to fulfill it thereafter so you could, arguably you could say look I've already done this work um, maybe I deserve to be paid for it, but I don't need to be paid for it. But all that work in the future, there's got to be something to kind of say, what, what you know, I'm, I'm a game designer. I'm not a warehouser and a printer. And a, you know, give, give yourself some money for the pain that you are going to feel in doing something that's not necessarily your forte or preferred thing to do. The other thing that I wanted to say is, if you are in the mindset of saying, I'm not going to pay myself, you're in the mindset of saying, how can I push my numbers down as low as possible? And that's that's kind of a good mindset to have, but I would just watch out for it because I've seen some people push the price of their reward tiers down because they are worried about whether people will buy them. And perhaps 
that's you know kind of saying oh i can't afford to pay myself because i need to push the prices down so that people will buy my product i would urge you not to do that i think that if you set your price low people will not value what you are offering look around at the market think about the thing that you are offering and how it compares to other things that are out there if you're producing like a 200 page book price it according to what the market is offering um, and then maybe you will be able to afford to pay yourself and that's that, that it is this is not just about the kind of effect on the the perceived value of a role playing game generally but of your product specifically and whether people see it as being something that's worth 25 quid rather than a tenner also by the way it makes it really really hard to fund if you set your things too low people often I'd, i've seen people do these kind of weird things where they set the price really really low and they haven't really thought through the fact that that's going to mean you need like a thousand backers just to reach their target and if they just set the price a bit higher it would have been so much easier um so and people question it as well if it's like why is this so cheap what's wrong with this and i've seen that so many times and like um, the, the people just not backed it because it's doesn't seem right there's something wrong there it rings alarm bells to them so yeah you know you're not selling your product properly you're undervaluing your product so yeah kind of sound like the what i remember of the early days of kickstarter when i was not even backing anything but i would hear people they would talk about it as some kind of bargain they would say oh look at all the miniatures i will get for that price and people were very excited about that and then there's been a serious, from what I understand, a serious backlash about that because a lot of those projects never came through because the, they were just not, the, the business plan was, was not good. I guess what we are saying is that the, the price needs to be right. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, on. I would go, the, the price, like you can look at what you can just about manage. Um, like, I, no doubt you could afford to charge less. But uh, you 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 don't want to be charging the only just amount because if you do, there are going to be unexpected costs. There are going to be you, you're going to you're putting yourself on a path to failure, in my view. But people do want uh, a deal when they're doing Kickstarters. A lot of people now I'm finding will wait to hit to um, distribution or retail. Um, so it really is becoming a time of. People look at it and go, you know, you're charging 14 kickstarts about what I'm paying in retail. So they they want all the extra trims, the stretch goals, and the extras that come with it. And go, well, if I back it now, I'm going to get the posters, I'm going to get the key rings, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They they want the whole package deal now, um, and that's the trend you're finding. Um, and before, obviously, you were talking about the free miniatures which was the crazy times when everybody was offering something free, like my page. And when I kickstart goes live, we'll give you a free miniature. Uh, but I did see an awful lot of companies do very, very well at doing that. And then Kickstarter, I think, released something and blocked it and said it wasn't going to allow people to do that. It was a breach of their terms and conditions. So a lot of people stopped doing it. Yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a real challenge in creating a Kickstarter that's got interest and that is giving backers something special for backing it that doesn't then cause problems further down the line. I've talked to quite a few uh, folk who have, again, including mistakes we've made early on, uh, where you've got a bespoke item or something that is going to, that, that reaches quite a long way outside of your core competency. Like publishing books is, I won't say completely straightforward, but there's a it's a fairly well trodden path you which you can go down. Publishing or cr creating anything else physical, um, it adds an entire second production process to your delivery, and it adds frequently a whole second set of concerns around how you're going to create a thing, how you're going to warehouse it, how you're going to ship it, how you're going to distribute it, additional customs conversations. If you're printing in one location, but your custom dice are being created in a second location, how are your timelines aligning on all of that? It's the sort of thing where, like for, for us, it was a case of going, well, we're going to create these beautiful limited edition newspaper clippings that are in the world of Spire. And they're really nice. And the problem is that we, in order to get them on good newsprint, we printed them as sort of a page of new pages of newsprint 
um, and then we had to cut them out. And that took a while. That really took a while. Um, we were because it, because it was printing. We were kind of basically okay with the production side of things. We you know we didn't have any problems there. It was just this moment where we were looking at a stack of several hundred of these things, going, okay, we've got four days before we need to start shipping things out. That means we've got two days with a guillotine. And Grant and I sat in our front room, watched terrible films, and literally spent two days like trashed a, trashed a guillotine completely in the process. Um, the, like paper cut a guillotine um, and got them out but that was that was a real learning experience about the promising bespoke content at particular backer levels um, the flip side of that is that doing limited editions of the book with particular with different binding or with special kind of elements that can be a relatively low kind of low risk way to give kickstarter backers something that maybe isn't going to make it into final distribution so there's there's ways of doing it but it's worth thinking about like working backwards from what a backer is going to have to get delivered to them. What is this adding to my production process? What's it adding to my timelines? What's it adding in terms of complexity? Um, do, do I believe that I can do this well and effectively? And if the answer to any of those questions scares you, then you're not, you probably not picked the right thing. I just, uh, just want to add when a lot of big, another big mistake that people do with stretch goals, they, when they, they're doing books, and that's all they're generally doing is a kickstart and role playing book, and then they'll um, go right. Okay, yeah, we're going to put dice in it. Suddenly, you've got a tax taxation going on to your product, and then not a lot of people know that. But your book is no tax on it. And then as soon as you put one single die on it, that entire product is taxed. And if you're not got uh, a proper fulfillment company together, and you haven't got your taxes sorted out, the back will be paid for that. So and backers know this as well so they, they look for this and go right well, is this eu friendly back to the brexit conversation here yeah, are we eu friendly uh, us friendly uh, am i going to get taxed for this so if you're doing a stretch goal you need to make sure you've got your tax side cover which you can look it's, it gets a bit complicated but you can look at the commodity uh, for the country to check how much taxation that you can be paying for the product. I always suggest using papers as much as possible because you can actually bind them into your book. If they're buying part of the book and their papers as a map, then you're not paying no taxes because it's part of the book because it's an insert. So there are, little, there are lots of tricks you can do, but if you've got dice, oh my God, don't do it. It's going to cost you more. Yes, you've got a cheap price, but it's going to cost you on the shipping price alone. That's what happened to me again as a backer. Uh, I backed Dan the Man Save the Music, which comes in a nice vinyl looking box uh, with dice. And my shipment was blocked at EFRO with a message telling me, you have to pay that much in taxes, otherwise you won't get your product. It was just there. And I was lucky to find out about it because I chased it and asked around what was happening to my package because custom were ready to ship it back to the US and then everybody were, was busy. It, it's quite interesting how you don't consider consequences, consequences sometimes. Uh, I remember a discussion on the Critical Role UK fan group and someone worked out how much time it would take to the cast of Critical Role to just sign the copies of the different things they, they promised to their backers. And yeah, just signing the book and sending it out was taking an awful lot uh, of amount of time so yeah, you need to consider all of that so a, a really simple trick that i uh, would recommend for anyone thinking of doing things like news clippings or signed copies or what have you is worth considering setting a limit it's a really easy thing that you could do with kickstarter yeah. um you know think about what what would happen if your kickstarter made uh, a million dollars and your expected 100 newspaper clippings became uh, 100,000. Um, I imagine that Maz might have broken more than one guillotine if that happened. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's exactly, that was exactly the issue with Spire. Spire was successful beyond what we were ever expecting. Um, and it wasn't until we'd, we'd had that success and then we were sort of sitting in, amongst the the actual numbers involved with that that we realized precisely what we've done to ourselves 
And the um, thing is, though, I, I was going to cite your newspaper clippings as a, an example of an, an impressive Kickstarter, actually, because I think one of the things that Kickstarter can do for you, it's not just creating a product. We're talking a lot about creating a product, but one of the things it does is it's an opportunity to get the attention of a potential audience and engage them. And I think one of the things that Roland Rook and Deckard do really, really well is engaging their audience when they have their attention uh, in a way that's more than just, oh, would you like to help us make this book? But here's this beautiful handmade thing that I've made, or here's this, this quirky little bit of kind of extra thing. That, I mean, not only does that draw people to your Kickstarter, but it creates fans, I think. And I think you can see that in the success that RRD have had. But obviously it does have <laughs> potential side effects. <laughs> so so the what we learned from that wasn't don't do the newspaper clippings because they were so popular and people you know we we were really lucky in our um in our choice of designer for those he put in an entire um arg in them without us asking him to it was, it's incredible um but the lesson we learned was don't create things that you then have to cut out by hand yourself so for heart um so not for heart for strata for the uh, source book for spire we did newspapers again but on this occasion, we did a full 12 page newspaper, which can be printed in one go as a single item and shipped in one go as a single item. So it takes all of the design and all of the ideas that we'd had and that we'd wanted to, we wanted to continue that. But instead of it being an enormous sort of lift, it was just another printing process that all went through the same distribution channels. So there's usually ways of doing these, well, not always, but often there's ways of doing these things that cut out the kind of bespoke element it's interesting that the, the no people plan for failure a lot and they think about failure a lot very few people really think about what it would mean if they were massively successful and the ways in which their process might break if that happened um and i'm um this isn't this is outside rpgs but i'm uh, i backed a very very successful uh, pin badge kickstarter last year um, that funded with, I think, several hundred thousand backers, um, you know, miles and miles and miles away above what was originally anticipated. And the creator has been brilliant at getting everything produced and everything um, created that she's promised, but she's doing shipping manually. She's had to move house because oh. there wasn't enough room in her house for all of the packages. Um, everything is it's just a case of going through and packaging. If you think about, even if you do a hundred parcels a day, every day across 200,000 backers, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> that's, it's going to take a while that, that those shipping deadlines have gone and have blown past and fair play to her. She's just beavering away and getting it done. Um, but if you haven't budgeted, if you haven't budgeted an, enough of a margin in your product so that if something like that happened you would be able to take advantage of a fulfillment system or do something different that would allow you to actually experience that success as success rather than an enormous amount more work it's worth working out before you push the button what that what would need to change about your kickstarter to make it success proof as well as, well as failure proof that's that's another reason to pay yourself by the way um because if you do have wildly excessive success um at least then you have some money that you you were going to pay yourself to do the you know thousand pins you thought you were going to be shipping now you can pay someone else and get them to do it but if you plan it correctly and you put it into your fulfillment companies to do it um for them to do it all i mean that's the way i'd always advise people get the factory to do most of the work as possible get it done as one package like you said uh, mary and so you have it all in one package and then it goes to the fulfillment company and they will do the bolt of the work and if it's done correctly you should be collecting the money from the backers for the shipping that should cover the cost for that but again back onto stretch goals you're doing a stretch gold or you're cutting something out or you put something in that warehouse will charge you for a picking fee for doing that. So you need to take that into your costs as well. But it's, I've always put it down, anything you're doing, no, just send it straight to the warehouse. So much. I've been there where I've had to pack things myself. <laughs> Never again. I've been, I haven't cut out with a guillotine yet. <laughs> but. I mean, I, I sort of agree with that, but I do remember when we did Lovecraft Desk, we were small scale enough that it was worth our while 
you know, we could save a few hundred quid by mm -hmm. doing our UK shipping ourselves. Didn't take that much effort because mm -hmm. um, we're just sticking stuff in book boxes, slapping a few stamps on an, a, an address label. And it saved us some money and it meant that we were able to pay ourselves a little bit more for something that otherwise that money's just going straight to a warehouse. So I, I think it's kind of, it's it's all about thinking about those different tiers of success, really. What would happen if I make 5,000? What happens if I make 50,000? What happens if I make 500,000? Because you don't know what which is going to be. Interesting, because for us, we looked at the relative costs. Um, I can't remember which, which, uh, which Kickstarter it was on, but it was cheaper. It was even including pick and pack. Um, it was cheaper for us to use a warehouse and fulfilment because they saved so much money on the postage because they oh. had a direct they had a direct deal with um, various postage carriers that enabled us. We, we, we couldn't have gotten those rates. So even when you took into account um, sort of the saving in pick and pack, it was still cheaper for us to go down that route. Um, I was about to add that as well. So you actually find in many cases they are... Uh, yeah, you know, most fulfillment companies should be cheaper than you going to directly to Royal Mail yourself because they've got such such large output volume of products going out. So um, you know, fulfillment company, do your research and find the right fulfillment company. And and the other thing is like factor get your quotes for that before you create your Kickstarter. You're going to need that information for your spreadsheets. And you're going to need that information to make a decision on whether you're going to include shipping in the Kickstarter or whether you're going to charge it later. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other considerations that come into that, right? So if you include shipping in your Kickstarter pledges, then that counts towards your Kickstarter total and Kickstarter takes fees on that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to fund with a smaller number of backers but and you're comfortable soaking the additional costs that are inherent in doing it that way, then that's fine. It makes the maths really quite complex um, and gets you to a place where you have to be comfortable that you're building in extra money in your shipping, sort of in your in what you're charging for shipping or in what you're charging for kind of individual pledges to cover the the quote unquote extra um, because you're not using that money to fund books. Um, if you're if you've calculated that it costs you two thousand pounds to print everything that you want and um and then you fund at two thousand pounds and it turns out that a third of that is actually shipping then you've only got you know you know you've only got uh 1300 quid or however much it is you don't actually have the amount that you need of course it's now fairly standard practice to use backer kit or similar to mm -hmm. do your shipping after the fact um i do recommend that to people uh, we felt very wary of it when we first started no one seems to really mind and it it takes an element of risk there's a number of different risks around sort of shipping prices going up but also if you if you got the percentage of people who are going to be in the us versus the uk or the rest of the world wrong that actually can mess with your profit margins and things like that uh, such that you fund but you wish you hadn't <laughs> I've, I've heard of people having that problem particularly us it's actually worse in the us i think shipping shipping in the us is dreadful and weird and expensive and if you if you get 10 percent more people in the rest of the world and, and you're a us kickstarter you really wish that that hadn't happened That's i was on a board, i went to a board games panel at gen con um last year and someone a, a u.s company stood up and said if you have more than five percent of your backers outside of the u.s then you haven't charged enough for international shipping um because you want your shipping to be effectively enough that it will put off most of your international backers because that is how much it will cost you which i found a really interesting viewpoint on how u.s companies deal with shipping to those of us outside of the outside of the country so are um, you saying that they are they are actively trying to discourage international mm -hmm. backers to participate to their their, fund, their campaigns then broadly speaking they weren't saying that we what you want to discourage people it's that if you get more than that number then chances are you're attracting your shipping isn't going to cover the cost of shipping to that number of people Okay. Because um, just because shipping board games and to some extent shipping books from the US to the rest of the world 
is punitively expensive. So it almost doesn't matter whether you're trying to put people off, they will be put off by the actual, the actual real cost of shipping. Like we made the decision uh, on heart to subsidize, as I said, to A, to, to subsidize our original cost and then to look at different methods of shipping and fulfillment into the US, specifically because US backers expect cheap shipping. Um, international backers are used to paying more, but certainly for board games, I think they're still not used to paying what it actually costs. Um, and shipping out of the US, especially with tariffs and everything else that's happening around that, can be complex and messy. So uh, it was it it was really interesting to get that perspective from someone outside of the UK, and it gave me a bit more perspective on things like Evil Hat's decision to not do um, international shipping at all. It's messy and it's complicated wherever you're going from, but US Kickstarters, RPG Kickstarters, can afford to live without the UK market. And UK RPG Kickstarters generally can't afford to live without the US market. So there's a real power difference there. Something like six, <clears throat> something like sixty percent of our market is US. So yeah, it, we really need the US. And whenever someone's doing an RPG, I always say to them, you know, uh, because majority of the customers are at UK. But there's a huge, huge market in the US, and if you can hit it and get your prices slashed down. So you're affordable for America. And even if you have to go into your cost price, I recommend it and go to reduce your shipping costs for America to entice them down. Um, and there are, like, the, there are the tactics that you can do, which is reducing the weight of your product because the role plan books are really heavy, really heavy. <laughs> so, and there's a couple of magic weight brackets in shipping, which is the one kg, two kg and five. So if you can get your pack of two kgs, the major one, and most role playing books are about 1.5 kg. And then we're getting technical weights here. So if you can get your RPG about 1.4, then taking your packaging into account and get it just under two kg, you're going to get nice cheaper rates for the US, reduce your rates down for the US, and you should be able to make them quite comparable. Um, and, you know. Yep. Spire plus strata together is 2.3 kilograms, and that is a problem. Ouch. <laughs> Spire on its own, fine. Strata on its own, fine. Both together, massive problem. <laughs> Does it make a difference? So that I, uh, I don't operate at that level of weight. Uh, our books are A5. They usually come in at less than a kilogram. Um, but I did look at sending over a big pallet of books to... Mm. Um, indie press revolution who would then send it on to customers uh, and obviously then you're going to be well over um, <laughs> those those brackets but presumably it doesn't matter as much because you're dividing it up uh, but i think it works out about two pounds a book for one of our uh, little books if you put them in a pallet and then if that works for bigger books that's about right and it, the, the goal is to try and get a container if you can get maybe 12 pallets across and what i've always tried encouraging within the industry is people trying to band together and ship it together and putting it into a container because then once you're in a 20 foot container you'll make you're only charging about 5p a book and then you're making and that's to the us and that's when you know you're, you're starting to make big profits and it's going to really make a big impact on your distribution um but you need huge quantities but this is going back into distribution side if you're going distribution you need to do huge quantities a lot of people publish might state where they're doing sending too little out to them and then they can't get circulated enough isn't that what yes. modifius is sort of doing by being the uh i'm not sure what's the right term distributor of legacy life among the wings i think spire is distributed by Modifius as well? But no, that, we, uh... we do all of our own distribution um, okay. because partly because we wanted to set up that network for ourselves. Um, we found that it was not worth it. We just we looked at uh, Modifius and a couple of other potential partnerships to do distribution and it did not it didn't make financial sense for us specifically. I think there are plenty of people for whom it does. Um, but we wanted to be in control of the marketing of our product. We wanted to be in control of a lot of the various other kind of elements around it. Um, and in some ways that has been really positive and in other ways, much less so. I think we would have been in much wider distribution in the US much faster if we'd gone into, into partnership. But I also think that we would have 
struggle to retain our brand in the way that we have wanted to have it. Um, we, you know, we're tiny. There's three of us. Only two of us are full time on it, despite having some really big and successful um, games. We are still this tiny, scrappy company, um, and we. It matters to us that people get really really good customer service from us so we've wanted to really keep ownership of the relationship that we have with our our, our players people who buy our products people who back our products on kickstarter and the people that play our games and those are did those are three distinct groups of people all of whom are really really important to us um so there's a couple there's a couple of interesting things here right around when you're planning in your kickstarter we plan these days we we plan around five to ten percent wastage which is books that will be sent out and will go missing or will get damaged in that process. We have a really clear policy around that, which is if you get in touch with us and tell us that the book has arrived in a condition that you're not happy with, we will send you a replacement. We are not going to sit and interrogate you about what's happened to it. Um, if, if a book has gone past its past the date when it should have arrived with you, we are going to send you, we will send you another book. If the second book turns up, that's great. You can give it to your friends. Hopefully you're going to be playing the game. That's not a, we don't see that as a negative for us, but it's really important. Again, if you're, I think, you know, to what Josh was saying earlier about your, your, your just about price, if you're not thinking about the way that you're going to treat people who have issues, then you might end up going, actually, that's a really big cost. And if you're in partnership with distributors, you don't necessarily have control over how they handle returns or how they handle issues like that. Whereas because we've kept that control, um, we've been able to, A, have that, build that quite personal relationship with people in a way that hopefully keeps them on side and makes them more likely to enjoy what we have coming out next time um but yeah it lets us it lets us make decisions like that that are potentially quite costly for the business because we know what we want to prioritize uh, you mentioned Jenkin and you meant and gary you were saying that the us is a, a massive share compared to any other countries and the other destination how as a british creator do you engage with that audience because correct me if i'm wrong a kickstarter campaign doesn't start once it hits kickstarter right it you need to be in touch with with the audience uh, have them be aware of that your campaign is coming of what your product is and so on so what were the ways you did that? Did, was it attending conventions? Was it engaging through different social media and platforms? To uh, oh yeah, what what do you recommend to do, and what what did you do? Social media is probably one of the strongest and best tools at the moment uh, for making everyone aware of your upcoming product that's coming out. Um, conventions are brilliant play testing i mean um best example is is with nibiru with federico um, worked very closely um helping him and mentoring him getting through his uh, kickstarter and my advice to him was uh, go to every convention <laughs> and every time you see someone who plays your game get them to sign up on your mailing list and he used to sit there with his tablet and go did you enjoy a game like, yeah they're great can you sign up <laughs> and he'll get people sign up and that's that's wow five people uh, for that game and then he might what, only get about 30 people for a convention from just running games, which is not many. But if you look at that, that those 30 people on your mailing lists, that's possibly um, 30 pledges, all at 30 to 40 pounds, which makes it quite good. And he would continuously go out and do this uh, through conventions. And then he would send out um, advertising on Facebook, send out little free campaigns for everybody to play in. Um, you can put yourself on drive through and do a free uh, download to play test my game because that's a huge reach drive through um, and then of course once they've gone onto drive through and have downloaded it you can then mail them to say hey thanks you've played my game i'm now live on kickstarter and then you because uh, people there's a huge market people just want to download free stuff on drive through um, so I think, and here's probably getting in trouble for saying, so he, he had about over a thousand people downloaded on drive throughs So he had a thousand people on separate mailing lists. Then he had his own mailing list to mail out to. So it, it's 
marketing marketing it's it's getting the email addresses of people's interests it's permission marketing as well so you have their permission their people are interested it's not like you just got a random email addresses these are people who generally want it um, it's going on forums talking about your games going on podcasts it's everything you can possibly do uh, day and night promote promote push 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 talk about your game much as possible to the point that people are sick of it and you can't break I have seen you never break, not even for a month or two. You will keep pushing till you go on your Kickstarter. And when you Kickstarter, then the sleep nights start because then you're going 24 seven pushing to get the Kickstarter highest possible to get the funding through. Um, of course, it's difficult if you're in England because America's the big chunk of it. Oh, wow. If I go to Gen Con, it's quite expensive. <laughs> um, so it's like you got to work out and weigh that up. If, can I afford to go to uh, America? But there's a lot of big conventions in Europe that you can afford to. You got, you got Essen, you got UK Games Expo, Dragon Meet. So there's some big conventions here. Uh, an example, when I was talking about Federico, he didn't go to Gen Con and he got a very successful Kickstarter. Um, there's, but conventions, talking to the press, um, doing things like what we're doing now, absolutely gold absolutely gold and they're the best method to promote it just talking about the game that point about um getting people's email addresses there is enormous value in that um in making sure that you've got some way to have an ongoing relationship or an ongoing conversation with the people who are even slightly interested in your game there's a bunch of quite complicated stuff that you need to sort of care about a little bit involving gdpr and not sending people emails that they haven't signed up to and that you don't have permission to send um, but we now so we have a, a a main email marketing list with about like it's only got about 800 people on it but those 800 people really really genuinely care about what we do and the the actual size of the the size of the number the number of people who might care enough about your game to take a punt on it is maybe yay big the number of people who will give you permission to email them is going to be a much smaller percentage of that probably an order of magnitude below um if even if you're that lucky um so those people are going to be your potentially your ambassadors. They're going to be the people that tell their mates that get excited and that forward things on. So they they matter, and building up that relationship is is critical. I think long term, no amount of Facebook ads that you've paid for will ever make up for a the, that kind of really sort of quite intimate, quite deliberate, really really high value relationship. Um, the other thing we use is Discord. And we've actually started putting a link to an invitation to our Discord um, server on a separate PDF in, I think now, almost every single one of our download um, marketplaces. So it comes if you buy a product from us on drive through, if you buy a product on our website, you get a little thing that says, hey, hey, thanks very much for buying this. It actually means a lot to us, specifically Grant, Chris and Mary, the three of us. But also, if you want to come along and hang out with us and chat about the game, here's a space where you can do that. And that means that we, when we were playtesting Heart, for example, we were able to post in that Discord and have a bunch of people go, yeah, actually, I am interested. I would like to playtest this. It gives you a, a space for people to come with questions about the game or to have conversations around it. It gives you a chance to see what people are saying. Um, but I'd say that the, it's mainly worth doing that if and only if you're willing to be an active participant and to help to create the conversations that you want to have in that environment. Um, if you're just sort of creating a space and then leaving it empty, it isn't going to do the work that you want it to do. You have to really deliberately create a community. Um, and that community will evolve over time and hopefully be really be a really good and happy space for you and a fantastic resource long term. But it takes work. It takes effort to build it. So I agree with that. Discord is doing very, very good for everybody at the moment. So yeah, tell you on that one. Josh, do you have all of that in place? Discord, newsletter, did you attend the convention with Last Fleet? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm, I'm on a slightly smaller scale uh, than the others, I think, and also have I have less time. Um, so sort of hearing uh, Gary talk about, oh, you, oh, you can't take a break, you can't let up. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, a a parent with two young kids i've got a, a job that isn't related to gaming that i have to go to 
um, and I, I also I value my mental health. Um, so what I uh, tend to say is do what you can do. Right. So I don't go to US conventions. Uh, I can't really afford it. And I, I think the stress of it might drive me mad. But I go to a couple of key UK conventions a year. It's quite good fun. I get to meet people who like my games. It's very uh, affirming. That's quite nice. And hopefully builds those relationships. I spend a lot of time talking about game design online because that's what interests me. And I think so. one of the things I would say is do the, what works for you and what engages you personally because people can tell um, if you're just kind of grinding it out I think there's a real difference if you're doing something you're passionate about I am passionate about the sort of mechanical aspects of game design so I blog about it I write on Twitter about it or if people are talking about it in my feeds then I go and respond to them and that seems to be quite effective in getting people to then follow me and take an interest in me, which hopefully then pays uh, dividends later on. The other thing I was going to say is uh, I was quite interested to hear that mailing lists are quite difficult to get people on. I have found when I ask people after a Kickstarter, uh, when I'm doing the fulfillment, doing the survey and all that, just ask them, would you like to be on my mailing list? Really high proportion of them say yes. Some of them then unsubscribe later on when they see what the dross that I write. But, um, you know, not that many. Uh, hopefully people are enjoying it. And campaign after campaign, I'm building up an asset that hopefully uh, gets people who like my games to to uh, be interested in more games that I'm producing. I just want to pick up on the conventions thing. Like, So Josh and I have been part of a group called the UK and the RPG League um, from the point where none of us I think would have been capable of doing any conventions or we would have really struggled to do anything on our own. Um, we banded together to try to make sure that we were all able to go to conventions despite the various kind of competing pressures of life. Like Rowan, Rick and Deckard, two thirds of us have fairly have, have disabilities that can really limit our capability to engage in events like that. Um, Josh and Becky are parents with day jobs and lives um, and the other members of the league have also you know are, are single person companies um, in all of those situations especially when you're when the returns aren't clear it can be really difficult to justify doing things like getting a stall on at a convention and I think you know I know that we as Rowan Rick and Deckard and I personally have enormously benefited from just banding together and going swapping ideas swapping thoughts swapping kind of like just details of how our businesses are working. I'm a better business person than I would have been if it weren't for that community. Um, and in addition to that, the capacity to go to conventions and have support and put put my efforts towards a collective endeavour and have the same in return has been valuable in ways that you know I can't. Uh, I could I could do an entire second podcast about to be honest with you. So I think I think that's worth calling out. Like there is strength in numbers. This isn't a this isn't a business where we need to be massively competitive and cutthroat. If the business, if the industry gets bigger, we all benefit. So there are usually ways that you can band together and find commonality and ask questions and find people who've done this before um, because people are gen generally really willing to share that expertise. If I can just add on that one, actually, one thing I've known, one of the reasons I love this industry so much is publishers, writers, they're all so friendly. They're also willing to help each other. Um, I'll speak for myself. If anyone has questions, they can email me. Absolutely fine. I don't mind. I'll give free advice. Yes, I do this as a business, but I always give free advice because I, I believe in this business and I believe that we, and it's not cutthroat. I don't think I've met anyone cutthroat in this industry at all. They're all willing to help uh, and they will push each other's businesses as well. Um, I, I remember uh, Chris Birch from Modifius, he actively was pushing D and D going through, and someone said to him, "Go, why are you pushing D and D? It's not your product." He said, "But it's the more people in this industry, it's bringing new blood in. So the more it is, it helps other people's businesses." Um, and he's absolutely right. It's about if there's more people in this industry, more people playing, it, it benefits us. So if we can help people, you know, we will help people. It's just like it's why we're doing this now. <laughs> 
bring more blood in, which oh, is the best thing that Kickstarter has done for us. So, uh, where we discuss like, the future, I think it's a, it would be actually a, a nice topic for a future we release present to have the UK, UK and Indie RPG League. Uh, we could have a, a nice little panel. There's definitely more than three people we could have uh, there. Uh, we are getting close to our hand time. Do you have any final thing to say uh, before you each plug yourselves? And Josh, I, I must say we don't have a... a sadly, I was hoping that uh, you would be fully funded. Your last missing... Uh, 150 pounds would be uh, would be in the bank uh, for you, but uh, that's not the case. So you need to to plug yourself hard here. You need to get those people to l listen to you and head straight. We've got three live viewers, one including myself. So you need to push very hard for uh, each of us to go put 50 pounds in there. No pressure. <laughs> so yeah, anything to add uh, on the subject of British Kickstarter Kickstarter campaigns? And I suppose the only thing I was going to add is um, I think you can cut your cloth to wait, no, I'm getting my metaphor wrong here. You can, uh, you know, th there's lots of different scales that you can operate here. The key thing is, uh, as, as you've probably heard throughout this whole thing, is, is planning. But you do the level of planning that you can manage and just try to make sure that success if you succeed you won't wish that you hadn't i think that would be you know my, my main piece of advice really um try to think about what will work for you and if that has to be pod because you don't want to have to worry about warehouses brilliant do that you know that's absolutely a valid thing to do um don't feel like you have to kind of go further than you're comfortable with initially and as you as you do that that will give you the confidence to go further. That's certainly what has worked for us. Mary, anything to add? Um, I think we've covered, we've covered a lot of ground and I've said, I've, I've said probably really? most of the things that I wanted to say. Um, I, think, I think the main thing I'd say is to add, to build on what, what Josh has said, is it helps to know what you're aiming for like what good looks like to you is far more important than what good looks like to everybody else. And I think when we're doing events like this, I always try to be really cognizant of the fact that there are some people who are building a business and want this to be their full-time gig. There are some people who just want to write about, who want to write role-playing games for whom a Kickstarter might be a way of activating that dream. And there are all sorts of people in between who might be seeing this in all sorts of different ways and some of the advice that we'll give will be specific and suitable to some of those people and some of it won't be relevant to you and I th if at the root of a lot of the mistakes that I see people make is that is just not knowing where to pitch themselves what it is that what it is that would look good and feel good for themselves and the answer might be that there's lots and lots of different things but you kind of have to pick one because it will guide the other way that you make decisions. It will guide your financial decisions. It will guide your printing decisions. It will guide whether you go down the pod route or the uh, litho route. It will, it will, if you know that and you have that kind of articulated for yourself in some meaningful way, a lot of other decisions get a lot easier further down the line. Um, so I, I think that's actually probably the most important bit of running a Kickstarter or even you know producing anything in this industry is knowing what exactly it is that you're hoping to get out of it, what good looks like, and then you can make decisions based on that. Gary? Uh, like I said, we've gone through it all. Um, I think the main thing I'd say is, is um, you know, is really connect to the community as much as possible, which is what you know, Mary was going talking about really really connect with them uh and really try and produce some whatever you're trying to do is of high quality and what we've said quite a lot is planning as well um and i think if you, you hit those key areas um and marketing actually marketing oh, that's my big obsession if you keep on, on those key areas and plan everything out um 
and you believe you can be successful, I think you will be successful. Uh, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And I don't think everyone is doing it. I know some people say everyone's jumping on it, but they're, they're, they're not really. Uh, so expect challenges um, and expect to hopefully succeed. And you will succeed if you follow every, all the rules pretty much. And I believe there are rules to these things as well. And don't, if your Kickstarter is not funded, that's not a failure because I know some people who succeeded afterwards uh, because they just wanted it to reach out and to, to make people aware who they were and it raised that awareness. So don't look at Kickstarter as purely as a money tool. You look at it as, as your reach to the community because it's been very successful for many people. Amazing. Um... So it's time for your final plug and to tell people where they can find you. Uh, we'll go backwards. So starting again with Gary. Um, so if you want to contact me for some questions on any of this, you can uh, reach me at gary-harper.com. That's Gary with two R's. Um, you can get me on uh, Twitter. I don't really tweet much. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm going to try a bit more now. That, that's Valus004, which is B-A-L-A-C-E-004. I'm more of a Facebook person, so feel free to reach out. I network on Facebook a lot. And maybe find you in person at the Royal Play Heaven. Still... Yeah, yeah. And then you got my, uh, see, I, I live and breathe this hobby too much. And I've got my hobby, which is the Role Play Haven. Uh, which I'm the operations director for. Um, you can find me probably at the new West London branch that is launching next Wednesday, which is branch number seven, which is super exciting. Uh, I'll be there uh, probably for the whole year until the next branch launches. Uh, wow. So, yeah, big. Uh, please support it, everybody, uh, because everything that we do at Roleplay Haven all the money goes to charity and the community picks where that money goes. So it's, it's really important to us. And importantly, it's a great place for you to play test your game, preparing for Kickstarter as well, which we do get quite a few people uh, coming in and doing. Uh, it's where Nibru started as well. It's a great place to network. A lot of professional uh, people from the role-playing industry are at role-play have all passed through it. Yeah, we... Um, I, probably say um, over half of the Modifia staff are from the Roleplay Haven, for example. So we, we've got a lot of the professionals and there's lots of other companies as well that come along. Most of them just hide because they just want a game. That's it. They <laughs> just go, oh, no, I don't want to do any work. I just want a game. I just want to... What is role-playing? I'm not actually played. All I do is write all the time. So it, it gives people that opportunity to switch off there as well. So if people are interested in that, let's... Um, rphaven.co.uk and then that'll give you more information. I put a link to all of that in the description of the episode. If you're uh, checking the podcast, if not, if it's in video, you will find it. Well, there's a description also, but it's also on your screen right now. You got a little handle under each participant's name. Mary, plug away. Yeah. Hey. So I am at News Mary almost everywhere on the internet. Um, that's N-E-W-S-M-A-R-Y, um, including Gmail. So if you want to get in touch with me or to ask questions or pick my brain about stuff, um, please feel free. Um, I offer some con free of charge consulting for diverse creators. Uh, so if that's a thing that you're interested in, give me a shout. Um, Rowan, Rook and Deckard, the easy, we, we picked a name that was really hard to spell. So the easy way to find us is to go to rrdgames.com and, and you can pre-order Heart uh, and see all of, our, all of the lovely things that we're doing for that at bit.ly slash heart dash RPG bit.ly slash heart dash rpg uh, and you can sign up for our e our lovely delightful mailing list at uh, bit.ly slash rrd games um, if that's a thing that floats your boat um, yeah i'm also i'm going to be speaking at the london tabletop industry networking event probably in february if that's a thing that you're interested in or this is a topic that you you're um, up for having kind of conversations in person with nice people about i'd strongly recommend um, looking them up on facebook it's london tabletop industry networking or london tin um come hang out with us It'd be fun i haven't been to the event yet but uh, i'm just 
connected to them via Facebook and, and Jane, uh, one of the founder, she's just amazing. And uh, she was the only one who gave us a question for today. So I definitely oh, want to check out <laughs> London Tabletop Industry Network. They got a rather active Discord channel as well. And uh, people should check maybe Hearty Dice Friends if they are interested. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah, my other two co-founders, um, they... Uh, they they have created a podcast called Hearty Dice Friends. If you're the kind of person that thinks about which uh, polyhedral dice is the sex. Mary, can you repeat that? You're disconnected, I think. I've lost Mary. Uh, me too. I think it's Same. everyone. Oh, is she gone? She almost made it to the end. Oh. Josh, maybe can you be your or fill that with your own plug? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our website is blackarmada.com. That's where you'll find our blog talking about game design and what we're up to. Uh, you can buy our games there. You can find links to most of the other things that we're doing. Um, I am Armada Josh on Twitter. That's where I do most of my social networking now that G Plus has sadly died. Um, we're also Black Armada on Patreon where we make small games and on Itch where we sell small games. Um, but the thing, if, if it is still January as you're listening to this podcast, then I urge you to go to Kickstarter to search for Last Fleet role playing game or Last Fleet RPG. Um, and uh, get on that because that's my latest game. It's uh, it's about um, brave pilots, officers, engineers, journalists, and politicians fleeing across space from the implacable and human adversary that destroyed their civilization. Um, it's basically Battlestar Galactica, the role-playing game uh, with the serial numbers very well filed off. Don't sue me. Uh, so if that sounds good, then go get it. Are you, have you been in talk to, to have uh, maybe actual play of them uh, on some show? I know, uh, sorry, uh, Byte Marks, because uh, I remember it with the, the former name, Byte Me, uh, has been on She's a Super Geek. Uh, is there going to be perchance a She's a Super Geek about Last Fleet or maybe a, a trial of uh, Last Fleet on the RPG Academy? I'm not uh. in the loop, so I don't know. I, I, I wish. Um, no, we do have some actual plays out there already. Um, so we've got uh, an actual play on YouTube. Um, uh, I'll give you a link that you can put in the show notes if you like. Um, and yeah, the UK, so the UK Indie League has an actual play podcast where we play each other's games. It's another Ooh. nice thing that you can do with fellow role players. It's a rather nice way to uh, experience different types of game as well, which I've really enjoyed. Um, and there will be uh, an actual play coming through that very soon. So uh, again, I'll have to give you a link. I, I can't remember how you quite how you get to our uh, podcast, but it's it's there if you search for a text space. Yeah, yeah, I will put it there. It's called so, the League League Presents. Is the yeah, name. I need to subscribe to this one. I was not aware of the UK uh, in the RPG League uh, podcast. So that's it for today. That's it for the very first Euro League present of 2020. I am Kalum. I was your host uh, from the Rodis podcast, a proud faculty member of the RPG Academy. That's my son screaming behind me. Uh, please, we've been talking about newsletter. The Euro List has got a um, a newsletter where you can find out about all our content, not only the Race Present, but the Race Podcast, the Film Studies, uh, Café Release, the bonus show, if you subscribe to us on Patreon. Uh, and uh, yeah, the newsletter could be used too for many things. Maybe a future Kickstarter. Maybe I've got some projects in mind. So uh, I'd be very interested in having more people subscribe. Uh, you can support the RPG Academy. We do that through our love for the hobby but we do have expense and supporting the release podcast or the RPG Academy through Patreon means a lot in terms of not only moral support, but allowing us to do more for the show. 
uh, what else? Yeah, uh, stuff you will hear about if you subscribe to the newsletter. To the newsletter. Uh, we've got the monthly Le Drinks and Dice, which is another set of events. Uh, it's free on London in addition to the Tabletop uh, Industry Network, uh, which takes place at Bad Moon Cafe. It's each first um, Wednesday of the month at Bad Moon Cafe, and it gathers many uh, RPG clubs, including, including the RP Evan, but also London RPG community, sometimes London in the RPG, sometimes or often, but very often, quite systematically, Phoenix Games Club, and I'm gonna let, I'm gonna sign off so my son can resume watching Timmy Time and Dougie on TV. Thank you so much uh, to my guests Gary, Josh, and Mary, who sadly got disconnected just at the end. And uh, go check their amazing work and project, and please support them. And see you next month on February 1st for second Euros Prison panel of 2020. It will be tabletop RPG as they do in Lusitania, or if you're not aware, Portugal. We have three Portuguese guests to tell us about how things are going on with the tabletop role-playing games there on the three one of the sunniest and most pleasant sides of the Atlantic. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you.